Welcome back to Faith Formation at Home. In this week's gospel, we get Luke's, uh, what people call the Sermon on the Plain. It's kind of Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount, which is the more famous talk from, from Matthew's gospel. Now, before we dive into this, some people will make a big deal out of, you know, well, in Matthew's gospel, it's on a mountain, and Luke's, it's on a plain. What gives? The gospels contradict each other. They don't contradict each other. Jesus had a three-year public ministry. He probably said these same things over and over and over again. I'm certain he said it once on a mountain and once on a plain, right, a level level area. He probably also said it on a boat and on a shore side and in somebody's house, right? So it's not the gospel contradicting each other. It's Matthew's highlighting the mountain feature for a specific reason. Luke is highlighting it in this plain for various reasons in Luke's gospel. What does he go on to say in here? These are the, the Beatitudes, right? And they differ a little bit from Matthew's Beatitudes, right? Beatitude just means blessed or happy, right? And so in here, uh, it talks about blessed are you poor, blessed are you who are hungry, blessed are you who are now weeping, right? You could also translate that as happy are you who are poor, happy are you who are weeping, happy are you. And that raises a lot of questions, right? Why, why would I be happy to be poor and weeping and miserable, right? A lot of saints have commented on these Beatitudes, and they've said, these are Jesus' keys to happiness, but they're also kind of like a ladder that helps you ascend to happiness. How does that work out? The first move in the spiritual life, if you really want to grow in spirituality and become spiritually mature, is to become poor. That doesn't necessarily mean sell your house and all your stuff. In some cases, that is the case, right? St. Francis of Assisi, that was God's calling on him. To sell everything you have uh, and go off and become, you know, start this mendicant order, the Franciscan order, right? That's not everybody's calling. What is what is God calling you to do with this, this sense of poverty? It's a poverty of spirit. It's a detachment from my stuff. Right? It doesn't mean you have to sell all of it or give it all away. Sometimes that helps to do that, right? But it's a detachment from my stuff so that if I don't have my favorite toy anymore, it's not the end of the world because stuff isn't what ultimately makes me happy, right? Uh, and if I, you know, my car stops working and I have to get another car, but I love that car, like, I can let it go, right? It's detachment from things. We can still use things in, in proper order, right? So it's a detachment from stuff is what goes on here. How in the world can you be happy or blessed when you're hungry, <laughs> right? It's a hunger for the things of God, right? So you've now detached yourself from stuff, from books, right? I'm in a library, from books, from toys, from cars, from video games, from whatever it is, and now you're hungry for something to fill that void, and you fill that with the things of God, right? I'm hungry for prayer. I'm hungry for doing good things. I'm hungry for, for spiritual practices and that sort of thing, right? Uh, what about when you're weeping? How can you be blessed and happy when you're weeping? It's a weeping and a mourning, not just to be sad. It's a mourning for my sins, right? So I've detached myself from stuff. I'm now hungry for the things of God, and I am now ready to weep over my past sins and move on from them, right? And so you're climbing this ladder of happiness and holiness. And the last one is kind of the most perplexing one, right? Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you and insult you, when they denounce your name as evil. Here's the point. All because of the Son of Man, on account of the Son of Man, right? You're blessed and happy, when you're living the Christian walk to the point that other people are, are a little put off by it, right? They're frustrated by it uh, because you're kind of a, a walking contradiction. You're happy and you've got something they want, but they're not quite willing to do what you did to get it. They're not quite willing to change their life and follow Jesus in a real meaningful way yet. And so because of that, they might lash out at you, right? There's a blessing in that, a, a closeness to God in that. Uh, and so that's the challenge from these Beatitudes. So possibly today, those are a lot to try to bite off. Maybe pick one of those as a family or as each individual of the family and try to figure out, I'm going to try to work on this poverty of spirit and detachment, especially as Lent is coming up. Or I'm going to try to work on this um, hungering for the things of God. Or I'm going to try to work better on weeping over my sins, not so that you can be sad and beat yourself up, but so that you can move on from them. All right, so there's your challenge. Pick one of these Beatitudes and try to figure out, how can I, how can I embrace this more this week? Our Bible story for our little ones from the Jesus Storybook Bible is The Captain of the Storm. It's that famous story of Jesus calming the storm at sea. It's an awesome story. It shows at the same time Jesus fully human and fully God, fully divine, right? The apostles are in this boat with Jesus, uh, and Jesus is asleep. And this storm, huge storm, shows up out of nowhere, which happens all the time on the Sea of Galilee, to the point that the apostles think they're going to sink and die, and Jesus is still asleep. The dude could sleep through a storm on a boat, right? He's fully human. He was exhausted from his ministry. He's passed out on the bottom of this boat. They have to wake him up and tell him, like, Jesus, we think we're going to die. Like, you need to help us out. And, of course, Jesus gets up and he calms the storm, and the storm stops immediately. So Jesus is fully God because he can just walk out on a boat and be like, all right, storm, stop, and it stops. So the lesson there for us is through the storms in our lives when we're, we're scared of you know, 
this, that, and the other thing, all the sorts of things. We're scared of the dark at bedtime. We're scared of going to school or to daycare or scared of, you know, providing for our families in a difficult time or whatever, whatever you might be afraid of. Jesus wants to enter into that storm and to calm it. Sometimes he just needs us to invite him into it and to ask him, Lord, save us. Catechism questions for our older kids focus on the fourth and fifth commandments, right? The fourth commitment, fourth commandment, honor your father and mother. Uh, St. Paul points out it's the first commandment with a promise, right? When God first gave this, this commandment, he said, honor your father and mother so that you may have a long life in the land that the Lord your God will give you, right? There's a promise there. So what, why does God give us this commandment? What is he protecting by this? Uh, he's protecting peace in the family, right? Children should honor our parents, and the corollary, the, the implication there is parents should be worthy of honor of their children and respect their children as well. So it's a two-way street, right? Kids honor parents, parents honor and protect their kids, uh, and it expands beyond just the household to kind of a general respect for authority. So you think about it, if everybody walks around disrespecting authority, not following the rules, not paying attention to the people who are, who are legitimately in charge of us, whether they're teachers, daycare workers, uh, our bosses, police, elected officials, all that sort of stuff. If we just ignore all the rules, then we have anarchy and chaos, and none of our families are safe. Respect for authority is very important for peace in the world, and that begins at home. And the next commandment in here, the fifth commandment, uh, you shall not kill, right? Why does God give us this commandment? This one seems the most obvious commandment in the world, right? We need to outlaw killing, <laughs> right? Why does God give us this commandment? Because it shows us that in God's list of 10 things that he's going to give us rules about, his most important things in the world, one of those is we should respect and honor life from conception to natural death. And there's all sorts of issues along the way in there that we could get into, and this, the catechism is going to tease some of those out, right? But ultimately, it's a respect for life in all of its forms. Now, a big question that a lot of people are going to ask is, well, you shall not kill. Like, what about soldiers in war? What about, like, uh, legitimate self-defense? Um, a better translation of that word kill would be murder. You shall not murder, right? Killing sometimes happens unintentionally uh, or sometimes happens intentionally in a, a scenario where it is actually good for you to kill, right? If someone is threatening your life and you can't get away and the only thing you can possibly do is kill them, then that might actually be morally, uh, you might be morally obligated to do that. And that's a good thing to protect yourself, right? That's very, very different from murder, which is you are no threat to me and I'm just going to eliminate your life, right? That is horrible. And that is what what God is, is calling out here, is murdering the innocent. You shall not murder the innocent. Self-defense is okay. Defending your country is a good thing. Uh, all these sorts of things. There's some nuance to this that you need to kind of flesh out. And, and kids, you're great at picking up on, well, that doesn't make sense because what about this scenario? So talk about those things as a family uh, and figure out where do you think the lines on this commandment are and where do you think they aren't? And if you have any questions, you know, shoot me an email, grab me at mass. Uh, I'd love to talk to you more about it.